Today, we're going to discuss a rapidly emerging topic across the global economy. Uh, our title today aptly named Carbon Credits and the Push for Net Zero, with a number of fascinating developments occurring both in our, our Canadian capital markets and, and around the world over the last year. Before I turn our attention towards uh, our, our set of events and our keynote and panel presentation today, uh, I'd like to first thank our, spon our sponsors, those who have lent their name and support in bringing today's presentation to you, uh, our audience. Air Burles, Baker McKenzie, Bennett Jones, BLG, Castlesbrock, Dentons, Goodmans, Gowlings, McMillan, Miller Thompson, Odyssey Trust, Steichman Elliott, and lastly, Wildeboard Delise. Thank you all for your support in bringing our presentation together today. Now, to the, the main event. I'm very proud to welcome an esteemed group of individuals to our digital corner of the universe this afternoon. Uh, in a short moment, you'll hear a keynote from the Honorable John Baird, former Senior Cabinet Minister for the Government of Canada and current Senior Advisor at Bennett Jones here in Toronto. He's been an instrumental and international leader both within and outside our Canadian borders across a number of industries and roles across private industry and public service. Of note, He's previously served as Minister of the Environment, which makes his commentary and remarks today in context of our event even more pertinent. John, following your presentation, I'll introduce our moderator and, and speakers. Uh, without further ado then, John, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. I first want to thank uh, Josh Schmidt and everyone at uh, Neil uh, for having me. Rather than give a formal address, I thought I'd just share some uh, thoughts and observation on what's going on with respect to climate change domestically and uh, just as importantly, internationally. And I uh, think I can do that from two perspectives. Uh, first, uh, Stephen Harper hated me so much, he made me Minister of the Environment, not once, but twice. Uh, so uh, I have uh, a lot of scars to show for my time there. I've also had the opportunity to work in uh, the corporate sector in Canada and around the world and have uh, seen how business is struggling to deal with this new reality. First, I wanted to make uh, just a few brief comments on the situation in Eastern Europe and uh, Ukraine. Uh, I've met with uh, Vladimir Putin on a few occasions face to face. I've uh, looked him in the eye and I want to tell you, I always thought right from the get go that this was an evil man. Uh, all leaders around the world, whether it be Prime Minister Trudeau, President Biden, President Xi in China and Putin, wake up with one priority every morning and that's to stay in power. But I genuinely believe that uh, Prime Ministers Trudeau, President Biden, President Xi, that their second goal is to help and advance the cause of their people. Uh, I simply don't think that's the case with uh, Vladimir Putin. I don't think he cares uh, about the average uh, member of the uh, Russian public. He sees himself as a great figure in history and he wants to advance his legacy, very similar to uh, a czar. Uh, and unlike the Cold War, there's no Politburo there uh, to keep him in check, uh, to check on his uh, authority. He makes all the shots and, uh, the, uh, and he uh, will be vicious in pursuing his goals. Unless he's taken out by his own military or by a revolution in uh, Russia, I think he will be brutal and the scale of the violence that you'll see will be uh, uncomprehendable. Uh, I'm not predicting World War III, but let me tell you, this is how world wars begin. So we should uh, keep the people of Ukraine in our uh, thoughts and prayers on what is a pretty dangerous situation. Now uh, on to climate change. We've seen a, a huge evolution on, of this issue over the last 20 years. The public has evolved around the world, and certainly in Canada. Uh, governments have evolved in their thinking in Canada and around the world. And corporations have really evolved. Uh, and investors, uh, this is the big surprise to me, investors have become seized with the issue. And have now we've seen case after case after case where they're becoming activists in holding uh, corporations' feet to the fire, both management and with the boards. I mean, you can see that, yeah, particularly with uh, the uh, three board appointments uh, at uh, ExxonMobil, uh, where a very, very small shareholder uh, was incredibly successful uh, at uh, pushing, uh, at pushing uh, ExxonMobil to, um, to, uh, to take a different stance. Uh, one of the things I've been shocked about in the last five years is the emergence of ESG uh, in recent years. It's absolutely astounded me how it has skyrocketed uh, to the top of the uh, corporate agenda. And it's not just uh, in those uh, high emitting industries that you uh, would think, industries like uh, oil and gas or in mining. Uh, it, and it's become a, a global phenomenon. And it's not from just what you call the usual suspects that would have a public interest. Uh, investors like uh, uh, the CPPIB or the Caisse de Depot uh, in Quebec 
its uh, huge global uh, investors like uh, BlackRock, um, TCI. I sit on the board of Canadian Pacific, and uh, TCI is our largest shareholder, and they have been very activist in recent years, not just on corporate performance, but on the ESG. And I have to tell you, we stand up and, uh, and take note. Uh, corporations are evolving from seeing it uh, as a huge challenge and beginning to think of it as an opportunity that could be rewarded in the marketplace. Uh, I think of uh, at Canadian Pacific, we have a, a consortium of solar farm at our uh, Calgary headquarters on our rail yard. Uh, that's a symbolic, meaningful measure. Having said that, um, we now have a full demonstration project of a hydrogen locomotive, something that I thought would take five or six years to get up and running. And it's actually, uh, it's actually the demonstration is actually uh, is actually uh, working, and I think the marketplace will uh, will respond positively to that. I also serve on the board of uh, Cisco Gold Royalties. Uh, it has evolved from uh, we have evolved from traditional environmental concerns on you know good uh, corporate citizenship uh, in mining, and we've made a major investment uh, in Carbon Streaming, whose uh, CEO will be on the panel after uh, my remarks. Uh, Carbon Streaming is an ESG principal company offering investors exposures to carbon credits. Carbon credits will expand and grow as a key instrument, not just for corporations, but for uh, governments uh, to achieve their net zero and net, uh, net neutral and net zero goals. Uh, providing, it provides investors with a tangible way to invest in a low carbon future. Uh, carbon credits, either voluntary or compliance driven, uh, will serve as a key compliance mechanism until innovation and technology can evolve. I've always thought that uh, the answer to climate change is technology, and it is lifestyle uh, decisions that we all make uh, individually in our personal lives and in our professional lives. There's just no way that we can move fast enough uh, on reducing carbon emissions without having uh, options uh, on compliance mechanisms, and carbon credits are obviously a, a, a very reliable way to take meaningful action in the short and, uh, and medium term. Uh, the 30% target for reductions by 2030 and the net zero goal by 2050 are very tough and they're very ambitious. And if those goals are to change, in my opinion, they're likely to get more stringent uh, rather than less stringent. Uh, speaking of Canada, uh, I have watched uh, the evolution of both federal and provincial environmental policies very closely for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, being dismissive of climate change, uh, I think is political suicide in 2022. Uh, ambitious goals uh, backed up by vague platitudes just don't cut it uh, anymore. Um, I think they, the market, the uh, environmental activists used to almost care more if the, you cared about it rather than if you did anything. And they're now demanding uh, political leadership that both cares and is committed to taking specific concrete action to, uh, to, get, uh, to get emissions uh, reduced. Uh, I've watched uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and his new environment minister, Stephen Gobeau. Uh, I call them true believers. They are passionately uh, committed to this. It is uh, not just an environmental goal for them. It is a moral goal. Uh, Trudeau, I believe, is serious in the pronouncements that he make and his appointment of Stephen Gibo uh, in after the uh, last fall's election is a real message that not only are they going to follow through with the, commi the specific commitments that they've made, uh, but they're going to actually accelerate them. Stephen Gibo has uh, been an environmental activist for most of his adult life. Uh, there's probably few people who've arrived uh, in the environment minister's office who are more knowledgeable uh, and focused on getting results than, uh, than he is. Uh, so that the big message I wanted to leave with, uh, with them, but to you about them, is, is that uh, they mean what they say and they say what they mean. Uh, they mean business and they will follow through on, uh, on what they have to say. Uh, they have laid out a pretty ambitious plan to raise the price of carbon to $170 a ton by 2030. Um, the situation in Russia and the huge increase in, uh, in oil prices that we've seen in recent days and weeks, um, I don't think it's going to get them uh, off, the, uh, off, their, uh, off their goals in the short term. Um, I certainly don't see them receding. They may uh, stall for uh, a quarter or two, uh, a year or two. But uh, I think uh, if I was a betting man, I'm not. If I was a betting man, I'd say they're going to make, uh, they're going to follow through on the, uh, uh, the commitments uh, that they've made. And I think uh, business, uh, businesses and corporations uh, will, uh, will follow through. Um, in Canada, we have a minority parliament. It's a pretty strong minority government. Uh, having said that, the government depends uh, on the support of, uh, generally speaking, the NDP uh, and the Bloc Québécois. And both the NDP and the Bloc Québécois have views that are even stronger uh, than uh, the, uh, the federal government. So um, uh, this will give the Trudeau government huge political cover 
to take the meaningful action with no concern on what's going to happen in Parliament. And if anything, they could say, you know, the devil made me do it if, uh, to their, uh, to their uh, moderate and centrist uh, base. Uh, finally, I just thought I'd make a, a, a brief comment on the science. Uh, the International Panel on Climate Change reports are only getting uh, more dire and are only getting more alarmist. Uh, I think these have a huge effect on uh, political discussions, a huge effect on corporations around the world, and uh, it will only accelerate uh, governments and corporations taking, uh, taking more aggressive action. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, be with this esteemed group and to uh, hearing your comments and answering uh, any questions. Uh, so thank you, for Neil, for, uh, for having me. Thank you, John. Our uh, absolute pleasure and truly appreciate your thoughtful and, and insightful remarks. Helpful context, setting the stage for the discussion to follow as, uh, to your point, investors continue to drive companies to do the right thing, uh, in particular oriented around ESG mandates and carbon credits. In effect, the intersection of investors, business and, and politics, I feel, at, at the heart of this discussion. Uh, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce and welcome a wider group to the stage as we set up for a discussion amongst a few different stakeholder groups uh, driving change. Please meet uh, our moderator, whom perhaps needs no introduction, Catherine Murray, former Wall Street professional and senior anchor at BNN Bloomberg. Uh, today, she's also on the national broadcast hosting her Sunday morning show, The Buck Stops Here. Uh, alongside Catherine, who will, will moderate, uh, we have Justin Cochran, uh, whom John Baird introduced for us already, CEO of Carbon Streaming Corporation, Michael Costa, CEO of Base Carbon, uh, passionate about the role of global financial markets can make in addressing climate change. We're also very pleased to welcome John Wilson, co-CEO of Nine Point Partners and founding principal. Uh, he and the firm oversee uh, the overall investment approach and research initiatives, a uh, number of mandates focused on, on this arena now as well. And of course, last but not least, our very own Josh Schmidt, president and CEO of the Neo Exchange, tier one stock market fueling and driving the innovation economy with global experience across the spectrum of financial services industry and capital markets at large. So with that, uh, Catherine, I would very much like mm. to turn the podium over to you to guide us through the next 45 minutes with this incredible group. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Eric, and uh, and welcome everybody um, to being with us today. Uh, very interesting comments from John. In fact, we're already getting questions. Uh, so please do send us your questions throughout the entire conversation. We will filter them through um, our panel discussion. Um, what is so interesting is the acceleration and the accelerating pace that we're seeing this happen. Um, the industry has been around for about 15 years. I remember the Chicago Climate Exchange. I was maybe even going to work there. Um, but that, that's what's so interesting about here and right now. So John Wilson, um, let me ask you just from a high level, what does the industry look like today, if you can kind of just break down how it actually operates in terms of the carbon pricing and carbon credits. Sure. Thanks, Catherine. And uh, thank you and everyone at Neo for having us today. Um, so essentially, um, terms get thrown a lot, around a lot related to this marketplace, and you'll hear terms like carbon credits or carbon offsets, and they're used interchangeably, but they're actually uh, somewhat different. Um, they both represent a carbon offset and a carbon credit both represent um, a, a ton of carbon. Uh, uh, what we call uh, the voluntary market is the much smaller part of the market, and that is what we also term as carbon offsets. And those are projects uh, like ones that, um, that we're going to hear from our other panelists that um, either reduce or um, find an alternative or avoid uh, the emission of one ton of carbon. So it's things like forestation or carbon capture and reuse or um, you know, renewables that are generating energy without producing a, a carbon emission. So that's the offset market. Um, it's outside any what we call the compliance schemes that I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, and it's majority, the majority of those credits are acquired by the private sector. And that, you know, private companies, as uh, Minister Baird was talking about, have a lot of social responsibility goals that they're getting a lot of pressure from their uh, shareholders about. And so they can use these projects as a way to help them offset any carbon emissions they have in their, their traditional business. Um, separate from that, there's a whole uh, much, much, much bigger market. Uh, that's what we call the compliance market. And you hear a number of terms related to that. Um, you hear ETS or the emissions trading systems, uh, the allowance market or cap and trade. Those are all really talking about the same thing, which is a market-based system that um, is, is set up either nationally or regionally uh, to try and reduce carbon emissions in traditional industries. Uh, 
Now, this has actually gained a lot of popularity around the world. There's 38 jurisdictions at last count that represent about 40% 40 of global GDP that are putting these types of systems in place. And they really have two elements. There's um, a cap. So, you know, you're an industry under our regulation with this system. You can only produce a certain amount of emission uh, of carbon. And then uh, there's allowances, which you need to have the allowances to allow you to emit that amount under the cap. Now, the idea is over time, if we're going to reach the goals that uh, Minister Baird laid out, these caps are going to drop consistently year over year and, and push industries to find better ways to reduce their emissions. Um, and allowances are the way that we can economically allow them to do that over time. Uh, and you can imagine, you know, obviously a, an industry that's typically under this type of cap is uh, utilities because they generate a ton of um, greenhouse gases. And, you know, you may have two utilities, one that um, is not able to meet its cap for whatever reason, it's not maybe running, it's, it didn't make it the kind of investments that allowed it to uh, be less uh, emissive in its carbon. Um, and so it goes over the cap and it has two choices. It can either pay what will turn out to be a very, very large fine, or it can go and purchase uh, these credits in uh, the secondary market. And similarly, there could be another utility that uh, makes you know, investments to reduce its carbon emissions and finds itself below its cap and it can sell those extra allowances or, or keep them for the future. So it, it, it provides a sort of carrot and stick approach to allow traditional industries over time to um, reduce their carbon emissions and get us towards those goals, which are, you know, those are going to take a significant amount of time and they are difficult goals. Uh, and I completely agree with Minister Baird. If anything, those goals are going to get more stringent. Uh, that, that horse has left the barn. Uh, that We're not going back the other way. So, um, so I thought just before I finish, I'd give a couple of just a little context for people because what is a ton of carbon? I don't think, you know, nobody wakes up in the morning and understands what a ton of carbon looks like. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you, know, you know, there's a couple of examples that people use. If you were to drive across the country, that generates about uh, a ton of carbon emissions. Your average uh, American, I don't have the stat for Canada, it's probably actually a little bit higher. Your average American generates about 16 tons over the course of a year. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of carbon that we have to take out of uh, the atmosphere. Um, just as one last comment on this market, it does trade publicly. So you can, in the futures market, uh, about 95% of the global carbon credits trade in the futures market <laughs> under the Intercontinental Exchange. Um, and it's a very large market. So this compliance market is about $800 billion last year. Um, the, the voluntary market is much, much smaller, a couple of orders of magnitude uh, smaller. And um, the prices, so the, the major jurisdictions that trade publicly are Europe, what we call EUA. Uh, and in North America, it's uh, California and Quebec under a, a jurisdiction called CCA. Uh, and then 11 states in the Northeast uh, United States called RGGI. Uh, a fourth one has just started trading, which is the UK, since it is officially out of the EU. It has just started trading in January. Um, and, you know, if you look at the price that is being set globally for carbon right now, it's around $80 in the European uh, jurisdiction and about $20 in the North American jurisdiction. That's obviously been bouncing around a lot, especially with the recent news in Ukraine. Um, but to Minister Baird's comment, you know, that Canada has a goal of $170 uh, for a ton of carbon by uh, 2030. And um, there's research out there that shows you need to be over 150 US per ton if we're going to even meet our goal of a one and a half degree increase in temperature on the planet. So, so that just gives you some context of yeah. what, what the market's about and, and some sizing. And so, Justin, let me bring you in in terms of um, your company and, and the projects that you invest in and how that helps to achieve the goals that, that we're going for. And also, you know, weigh in as it relates to the price, the, the pricing that you see occurring. Yeah, and, and, and thanks very much, Catherine. And thanks, Neo, for, for hosting. Really appreciate uh, being here. So when, when, we, when we look at this market, there's, there's 6,000 carbon projects in existence today. So what, what, what John Wilson referred to as, as, as these voluntary carbon projects that are either reducing or actively sequestering carbon from the atmosphere, 6,000 projects in existence, thousands more that need to be developed over the next a couple of decades as we pursue our net, net zero ambitions. And we had a fundamental belief that the capital markets have to play a material role in providing capital to this sector. 
um, and supporting, supporting these carbon projects around the globe. Uh, when we look at the voluntary market, as, 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 as John was referring to, average pricing is between five and ten dollars for, for each carbon credit, each, each carbon offset, um, compared again to the sort of 20 to 80 dollar compliance market price. And as, as, as John referred to, that, that 100 to 150 dollar incentive price that we need, that we believe we need in order to pursue our net zero ambition. So, so um, carbon prices, voluntary carbon prices have moved a lot in, in, in recent weeks, again, because of some of the, the, the instability that we see in Europe. Um, but fundamentally, we have a belief that carbon price needs to go much higher to incentivize investment to develop these carbon projects around the world. McKinsey had a fantastic report out a few weeks ago saying this industry needs $9 trillion in annual spending to pursue our net zero ambitions. That's, that's seven to 9% of global GDP. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work uh, that's already started, but a lot, of, a lot of work to be done and the capital markets have to play a role and uh, we're excited to be a leader in that space. Josh, let me bring you in on that point in terms of the capital markets and, and what you're seeing in terms of uh, deals and the pipeline. Let me admit first, uh, because okay. otherwise it's not very, uh, very effective. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, the message that you heard uh, so far is a message that this is, uh, yes, uh, a, a market or an industry that has been around for, for, for probably 15 years, but it's, it's, uh, registering uh, an incredible acceleration, and we see that uh, very clearly. You know, not only with with organizations like Base Carbon, Carbon Streaming, uh, listing on uh, on Neo, uh, John Wilson uh, coming with uh, with uh, an ETF focus on that space, but the pipeline is very strong. Also, uh, there's probably another six to seven companies currently working on on getting into this uh, this space and coming, uh, you know, with their own initiatives. And, and projects. So I think that there's a, a realization here that uh, one, uh, we need to, uh, to move. Things are happening. Pressure is going to be there. Uh, governments are going to put a lot of pressure on, on people. Investors are going to put a lot of pressure on people. Then we need solutions that are going to allow us uh, to, to reduce uh, uh, you know, greenhouse uh, gas uh, emissions. So I, I think it's there and, and it accelerates. And, and from a NEO perspective, uh, I, I think it's uh, you know the perfect example of what 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 we are are all about. Uh, you know we are uh, an exchange that has been you know clearly defining itself as, as an exchange that is there to support the innovation economy. And when you think about the innovation economy, I, I always think about three things. Uh, it's companies that are driven by R and uh, research and development and technology. It's companies with a very strong ESG focus, and it's companies that have a global uh, vision. And, uh, you know, is there a better example than, uh, you know, companies focusing on carbon projects, uh, companies focusing on, on generating carbon credits of, of what that innovation economy is? And, uh, you know, you've seen us in the past in, in other industries, we always try to be at the forefront of those new developments in the innovation economy. And, and, and uh, I think that our role is not only to help enabling it and, and doing something that I find is absolutely fascinating, allowing the capital markets to play a critical role in giving us a better future. Uh, but I also think we have a very important role to play in, in helping to inform and, and educate, because this is a very new world. Uh, you heard John Wilson talking a bit about the market, lots of acronyms, lots of complex words. Words. It is, in fact, not that complex. The opportunity or the, the impact is, is tremendous. And in fact, the return opportunity is very big also. So this, this is something that I think is great and, and that you know, more and more investors need to well understand. I think institutional investors are getting it. Okay, we actually have some, some questions on that, but let me just first bring in Michael in terms of understanding um, your view of the industry right now, because some people do think, and there's a question here, that it is still the wild, wild west. Um, you know, what, what are you doing from um, your company perspective in this industry, Michael? Thank, thank you. And, and again, thank you to the NEO and to Joe for hosting this. I think it's a, it's a really important forum for investors and for the broader public. As you said in your opening remarks, Catherine, I think that there's a misconception that carbon markets are new. 
but they've really been around for the better part of 20 years. I think what's new that's happening, as jo Justin talked about in his comments, is the, the financialization um, and really the public market financialization of carbon markets. And we think it's really important. And I think that the, when you think about the scale, again, in Justin's comments, there was, you know, we, we saw that McKinsey report as well, and the scale is just tremendous to change how we as a species, fundamentally, this transcends sends business or capital markets, but it's really how we organize ourselves as a species in this globe. Um, to achieve those goals, it's going to need, need capital, not just from the pools of, of, of historic capital and from environmental groups that are focused on this, but it's a, a whole capital structure and a, and a whole market effect. In terms of the overall market, you know, another way to think about it is if you look at some conservative estimates and the ones that we look at primarily from a, a company called Trove that does really good carbon, carbon research, on conservative estimates, the size of the market should be about $25 billion, give or take, by 2030. Again, you know, a lot of price assumptions and growth assumptions that go in there, but if you take that as a base case, that's about building the size of, of half, and we're right now we're in the voluntary markets for some billion dollars. That's effectively like building half of the global nickel market in eight years. So it's, you know, these are big numbers and they're big numbers, especially when you put a temporal overlay on top of it, but it's, it's such a huge lift for the markets and it's the, the, the importance of public capital um, is, is so crucial to us. And this is one of the main reasons we started about thinking about and building base carbon and saw the need there and saw the opportunity on the commercialization side. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, I do want to get to some of the questions in the interest of time. Um, and we'll see who's most appropriate to answer. Or I think maybe a lot, everyone. Uh, but one of the questions, um, the carbon market still feels like the Wild West. Large corporate buyers are faced with the choice of investing in decarbonization initiatives or taking a punt on credits, which have a lot of uncertainty. When do you see the market evolving sufficiently for buyers to make confident purchasing investing decisions in carbon credits. Who might like to take that question? Uh, I can start if you like, Catherine. Sure, I'd please. Love to hear uh, the other panelists chime in. So I, I would I'd actually disagree. Uh, I mean, one of, the, um, one of the benefits certainly of the publicly traded uh, futures market, and there's an over-the-counter market as well uh, for companies to use, but it helps reduce their risk and their uncertainty regarding what the future price of carbon is going to be if you can lock it in and hedge if you're an emitter and you can use the, fu the futures market to say, okay, well, this project makes sense or um, you know, I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna produce this much of carbon. Maybe, you know, a lot of power um, companies or even big emitters have long-term contracts with their clients. So they already have some visibility on what their emissions are gonna be and they like to lock in and know what their costs are gonna be. Uh, and so the publicly traded um, markets allow them to do that. It, it actually is a far more efficient way for them to run their businesses, even in the context where that cap keeps coming down and they know they have to keep reducing their emissions. Um, it, it allows them, it, it actually removes that uncertainty um, and helps them run their business. So um, a lot for okay. uh, Justin and Mark. Yeah, and, and, and what I would add is when you think about these large corporate buyers, they aren't facing a choice between decarbonization and, and buying credits. They're doing both. Yeah. Uh, and, and the purpose of the offset market is, is to allow those corporate buyers who, uh, as John Wilson indicated, these, these changes to decarbonize your business, that is expected to take you know, one, two, in some cases, three decades. Um, and so in the meantime, what carbon offset projects allow you to do is offset the remaining emissions that you aren't able to instantly reduce. And so, so carbon projects play a very important role in that net zero equation. And, and the reason we, we call it net zero, of course, and not zero, <coughs> we're, not, we're not pursuing a zero ambition, we're, we're pursuing a net zero ambition. And that is because there will be remaining emissions, global emissions that are then offset by these projects. So these, these carbon offset projects play a critical role both in the short term and in the long term. And, and, okay. I'd, like, and I'd like to add on top of that, just add on the, the prior comments. I think that when, when you consider carbon projects, reducing is part, of, part and parcel of many of these businesses, whether you're, you're in a consumer product business or an oil and gas company. It's part of the overall, the enterprise that you're engaged in. But a carbon project is an entity in and of itself. And that's where businesses like base carbon or carbon streaming come into play in that we're experts 
in the projects themselves and we're providing our expertise, our capital, and those credits then to the, the companies that need them. It's, it's a very different enterprise than what they're typically engaged in, which is another benefit of, of these businesses being their own standalone entities. And Michael, let me just go ahead. All right, I was just gonna make one last comment on the volatility of car, you know, the price of carbon credits recently. So, I mean, there's, there's a couple of things to keep in mind there. And I'm talking about the public markets here. Um, one, um, you know, to Mr. Barry's earlier comments, we're in the very, very, very early stage of this whole market developing. This is going to take decades. Uh, that's what's so appealing to us about the marketplace. I mean, I, I characterize it as the top of the first inning, and we've got a long way to go. It's going to take a while. Uh, this market's going to get much, much, much larger. Uh, but in its early stages, all asset classes tend to be more volatile, and that certainly has been the case. As much as it's been a very appealing investment in terms of what the price of carbon has done over the last couple of years, uh, it's been more volatile. Um, then the second thing, obviously, is a very, very unusual situation in Europe with, you know, a war. And, and I'm not, I never, I certainly never hope to see this happen in my lifetime. Um, but that has created a lot of instability in the European market, which is the biggest market out there right now. So that that's all contributed to it. Um, I, I think, you know, if you have a longer time frame, um, you know, over what's happening immediately, you can expect this market to get a lot bigger, less volatile and more of a stable asset class. No, I think that's really help, helpful for sure, John, in terms of the perspective as to where we are, um, because I think that, you know, today we're, we're trying to understand it more. That's why we're all together, um, become more educated. And also, of course, we've got, you know, viewers listening who want to also understand if we're at the beginning of this big accelerating growth asset class, how do I... Um, be, continue to become knowledgeable and up to date and up to speed. So, Michael, let me ask you because you use the word expert. You are experts in finding these projects and implementing these projects. Give us a little bit of, um, you know, thoughts in terms of what people should be looking at and thinking about because there could be some copycat, um, you know, investors out there or uh, that the people have to be uh, concerned about or wary of. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that there's, there's certainly, there's the education portion of it, and then there's the actual practice. On our end, we're practitioners. So from a project standpoint, what we've done at Base Carbon is we've built a team of, of individuals who've been in the voluntary carbon markets for decades. Our overall team boasts in excess of 50 years of experience in carbon markets. They've developed projects, they've underwritten projects as portfolio managers, and they've overseen projects. So for us, it's that, that rigor that our team brings to the table is really important for us. The second thing is, and I think you know, from an educational standpoint, it's important for investors to understand, and it gets back to the, the, the query around Wild West. This isn't us determining that there's a carbon credit out there. There's a very tried and true process with third-party bodies that, that validate and verify which are effectively capital letter terms in the carbon markets um, that validate and verify projects. And then those credits are, are bona fide VERs that can be then sold to the end market user who's going to use them, as Justin talked about, to offset because they can't, re they can't certainly reduce to zero. So it's really, you know, it's about that experience that you bring to the table and it's about the, the access to the projects from our opinion. All right. Um, I do want to address some of these questions because they are excellent. Uh, Minister Baird, I want to bring you in, and I think you made it very clear um, in terms of your view as to where we are, that there are real concerns, alarmist reports out there, and that the Canadian government won't recede. Uh, this question talks a little bit about, of course, the concern regarding Ukraine and Russia right now. Do you see a potential setback for net zero and the carbon credit market, if not broader ESG, due to the recent Ukraine war and energy crisis, is the climate issue becoming less important secondary given rising inflation seems uh, more imminent? There's no doubt that uh, when the economy goes south, concern for the environment uh, falls as a political issue. I think we've, just, we've got not just though public opinion, uh, which maybe 20 years ago was driving it, uh, we've got a more activist corporate sector, more activist um, investor group, and I don't think they're going to lay out, lay up. Um, we don't know how long the uh, the war in Ukraine uh, will go on. Uh, you know, many people thought it would be over by now, uh, but uh, it's it's gone on uh, demonstrably longer than certainly the Russians had expected. So I think we're in for a period of instability, and uh, we'll only see. I have noticed that President Biden doesn't seem to be blinking on uh, on anything in terms of uh, reactivating Keystone uh, or other uh, or other initiatives. There are no quick fixes to uh, Europe's dependence on Russian energy. 
so uh, we'll take a wait and see approach. Uh, it's fine for Canada and the United States to ban uh, Russian oil. But we have alternatives. Um, uh, Germany, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia have huge, huge dependencies on uh, Russian energy, and I'm not sure they're going to be able to uh, to uh, uh, to uh, join a boycott of uh, of Russian energy. How these three former Soviet republics could allow themselves to be tied so in their future and their economies tied so closely to the Russian uh, government? Uh, just I just shake my head; it escapes me. Um, it certainly, if anything, could accelerate um, uh, renewables and the like. Fair point. Um, another question here. Um, What's your view on carbon credit and clean energy? Are they a natural hedge against each other? Which has better investment opportunity potential? Also the downside risk respectively. Who might like to take that question? Yeah, I'm happy to, to address okay. it quickly, um, Catherine. And, and, and again, I would have a similar response to the first one where, where they're not mutually exclusive. Um, you know, we, we see renewable energy and certainly reducing emissions from the power sector as being a critical pathway to decarbonizing um, our global or reducing our global emissions. And certainly in, in, a, in a lot of cases, a low cost way, a low hanging fruit in terms of, of reducing carbon emissions. Uh, but when you look at you know, industry, the transportation sector, commercial bu businesses, factories, it's the higher cost side of, of the carbon emission spectrum, if you will, that is, that is very costly to, to abate. And that's where carbon projects and, and, and investment in these, in these global projects becomes critical to offset the emissions from those industries. So I think they're both absolutely critical to pursuing our net zero emissions over the next couple of decades. Okay. Also, I think it'll Thank depend you. on which jurisdiction yeah. you're in. Um, you know, for, I'm from Ontario. I was Minister of Energy in Ontario under the previous Conservative government. And, you know, uh, you know, Ontario, we have still have uh, hydro that we can uh, we can uh, we can uh, build. Uh, we have opportunities, obviously, to expand the nuclear. Uh, but, you know, going back to coal, I mean, just even under the Ford government, uh, they blew up the uh, former Lambton coal generating station uh, last week. Uh, so you, there's no going back. I don't think there's even in a place like Ontario, there's no even capacity, in my opinion, to even build more uh uh, a combined cycle natural gas, uh, zero emission is, is, uh, is what uh, people expect and demand. And to pick up on that point, in terms of jurisdictions, Minister Baird, uh, another question here. In Canada, separate regulations in each province, plus federal government Paris commitment. Any thoughts on how NEO and its companies can help harmonize and bring more efficiency in across the markets? I mean, I think it's, it can be, it can adapt to the reality in different uh, jurisdictions. Obviously, a place like uh, Quebec uh, or Manitoba have huge reliances on uh, non emitting uh, hydroelectric power. Other areas like uh, Nova Scotia or Saskatchewan are, are relying, continue to rely on, uh, on coal. So I think the, there'll be a different solution for, uh, for different jurisdictions in this country. And the fact, that it's, <clears throat> the fact that I think we want to have a standard goal across the, uh, across the country by province, but there may be different ways each, uh, each player has to get there. Some will take bold actions like Ontario. Uh, when I was minister, we had 24% of the electricity mix was coal. Uh, today, uh, coal is zero. Uh, so it depends on the ambition and, uh, and the reality that each jurisdiction has to deal with. Just, do you want to pick up on that as well? Because the question also encompassed uh, how can NEO and its companies help harmonize? What, what role do you think NEO can play in this? Well, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, we can play a big uh, role from a perspective of, of harmonizing, but I think where we can play a, a very big role is in, um, uh, you know, really turning this, 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 this industry into a mainstream industry. And that takes us a little bit back to your, to your earlier question and the point that, that John made when, when we addressed the Wild Wild West concept. When, when, when I look back you know, in, in, in history, when new commodities emerge or new industries emerge, uh, it's always a Wild West. And then there's a moment it reaches a certain level of maturity and uh, there, there's a desire to start to see it in fact, being uh, standardized, being subject to uh, regulatory requirements, being more transparent. And what that leads to, and that is where we are today for me with the entire carbon industry, it leads to those commodities and in, in this case, uh, related companies uh, becoming tradable on, on recognized exchanges. And whether that is the futures that uh, John talks about 
uh, or whether it is the companies that, uh, that are now listing on, on the NEO exchange, that is a, a core element that is telling you that there's maturity emerging in this environment. And what it's going to provide the, the investors is price discovery, is benchmarks, is, is comparables, and an, an understanding of you know, what is happening in that market, how the prices are evolving. This will not eliminate volatility, uh, particularly you know, when you look at the, the, the circumstances in which we, we live now, where we have multiple uh, you know, uh, macroeconomic elements that, that, that affect us, plus what you see happening, of course, in, in, in Ukraine and, and other parts of the world, because I think there's lots of parts of the world for the moment that, that are facing challenges. So it's not going to take away volatility, but volatility is, is natural. It's going to, volatility is going to be also a bit higher, by the way, in, in what is you know, a growth market. Uh, so it's mature, it, 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 it gets traded on exchanges and on venues, but it's still a growth market. So that, that creates volatility also. And, and, and I think what, what we bring as an exchange is a price discovery mechanism. It is uh, an affirmation that the companies that, uh, that list and go public on, on our exchange went through a thorough review process so that you have a level of comfort that that these are you know quality companies that are going uh, going public i think that is what we what we bring uh, i think standardization is 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 a bit of a of a different uh, topic and i think that standardization is coming from certain types of organization that michael and justin are probably much better positioned to to talk about and i'm thinking uh, about you know the companies that certify uh, the, the carbon credits so they they are playing a very key role in 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 that Okay, thank you. Um, and, and speaking of that, um, when we think about investing in this area, let's talk a little bit about regulation. This is one of the questions. How do companies effectively trust the verification of carbon credits when there is no established federal regulatory entity or compliance entity to oversee the recognition of what is truly a recognized carbon credit to avoid fraudulent carbon credits? Um, Justin or Michael. Michael, do you want to weigh in on that, please? Yeah, the you know Vera and Gold Standard are the two leading registries in the industry, and notwithstanding they are not you know backed by a government, you know they're very well recognized. And it's the same way I'd say even that you know you think about large auditing firms that aren't necessarily backed by a government, who are really getting to the idea of trust. And you know when you think through the process of how a voluntary carbon credit is is created it's the the registries are involved they're third party there's an incredible amount of trust as justin talked about there's thousands of current projects and you know many thousands of more projects that are going to be necessary to get to where we need to get to as a species again but also behind that there are the auditing firms um, outside of the the auditors but the the firms that would count uh, the number of tons of metal in an LME warehouse are the same firms that that ver- that that help you do your validation and verification in certain projects. And so again, it's it's I think that the thought that there may be a wild west west aspect is more from a standpoint of lack of understanding, which is why forums like this are wonderful, as opposed to it being a true wild west. Understood, Justin. Let me ask you as well. Um, you know, when you think about the the projects out there right now, and as you look at the pipeline of projects, this is a question uh, that can generate carbon offsets now. Um, what are the biggest risks? You know, we're talking about a lot of opportunity here uh, in, a, in a very large growing and accelerating growth asset class, but what are the biggest risks? Natural disasters, damaging assets that are meant to generate offsets, pest infestations, or political risk? Justin? Yeah, I mean, uh, so so all of those those ones that you identified are risks to uh, specifically when we're looking at forest conservation projects, uh, but also important to know as part of the scrutiny and the in the auditing process, there are credits that are set aside to to account for the potential risks of things like natural disasters and and forest fires and and illegal harvesting that occur that can occur at some of these projects. So so Vera, which is by far the largest organization that 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 verifies these credits, they actually have this concept of a buffer account, which in effect acts as an insurance policy to make sure that those those events or potential events. Are appropriately are appropriately counted for, um, and such that the buyer of the credits can then then rely on the fact that the actual emission reduction that they're buying is protected against 
those types of events from, from occurring. So there are project specific risks, of course, there are regulatory risks that exist at all of these projects. It's why it's important from an investment perspective to have a diversified portfolio of projects, both by project types and by ge and, and different geographies around the, around the world. And on that note, in terms of how people might want to dip their toe into investing in this area, can you break it down into the buckets in terms of where people should be paying attention? Um, John, I, you've talked a little bit about the futures market, John Wilson. Um, can we kind of figure out how to, which buckets to put everything in? Well, I mean, for your average investor, the easiest and simplest way, I mean, we, we as Josh mentioned, we listed an ETF on the Neo Exchange called CBON, C-B-O-N, that um, gives equal weight to the uh, publicly traded futures exchanges for each of these carbon markets. So for Europe, uh, CCA, California, Quebec, and uh, for the Northeast US, we're actually on the rebalance at the end of the quarter adding, um, there's the UK, we'll, we'll come in to that market as well. So that's just an easy way to you know, purchase an ETF and you know, the, the, what we think is attractive about it, uh, you know, we already talked about the long-term nature of the, the price of carbon going much, much higher, but it's also proven to be very uncorrelated from other asset classes. Now, everything got a little bit correlated when Russia invented or invaded Ukraine, but prior to that, uh, it has very, very low uh, correlation to either equities or bonds or anything else. Um, and, um, and we think that's a really important um, way for people to look at diversifying their portfolios. It also has the additional benefit uh, of, you know, you're effectively owning allowances, which, you know, other investments, many people now are investing in traditional energy. It's done very, very well over the last 24 months. Um, and that is obviously a carbon emitting industry. So in a way you're buying allowances uh, for your carbon emitting part of your portfolio. Now, there's also direct ways to uh, make investments, which are, um, you know, buying companies like Justin and Marks, but, you know, base carbon or, or carbon streaming. And, um, you know, that's a, your way of owning a company that's participating in the voluntary market. But I'll let those two uh, talk about other ways to access that. Michael and Justin, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah. I think from my standpoint, I, I, I very much agree with John's comments. I think it really comes down to the idea and the concept of risk. And these are projects and investing directly in projects are something that's very difficult for an individual investor, even an investment fund to be involved in. It's a very bespoken activity. It's a private market activity. And so one of the things that the public companies like Base Carbon bring to it is not just the access to the, to the projects, but Justin talked about diversification, whether it be a ge geographic diversification or project type diversification. That's just one mechanism of risk management that a public company can bring to it. You know, on our end, I've spent my, my career as a portfolio manager. So we, we've overlaid the idea of, of actual portfolio management on a portfolio of carbon credits as we, as we build our business. So it's really, it's really where that, that risk can lie. And I do think there's a lot of risk mitigation that can happen either, as John talked about, in ETF strategies, um, in very one viable way, or in the public companies uh, for you know, very much like base carbon or carbon streaming. Thank you for that. And Minister Beer, let me ask you this. Um, how does China fit in all of this? I think, uh, I think oh. John, uh, John had to leave, uh, Catherine. Oh, so, uh, okay. Thank I, I can you. tell you, yeah. Catherine, China did launch uh, an ETS um, mm -hmm. marketplace in 2021. So they actually spent a couple of years putting that together and it, it just launched uh, last year. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in on this in terms of the goals and even with the Russia-Ukraine conflict, how that might factor in with China? Maybe not. I, I, I'd, <laughs> that's I'd be that's, happy a, to that's jump. a triple I, derivative. I, I, <laughs> go, I, go on, Michael. I, I'd be happy to jump in. Look, I, I think that this, you know, it's it doesn't address China specifically, but this this is a global problem and it's a problem that that we have a clear solution and carbon markets and voluntary carbon markets are part of that solution. So, you know, from our standpoint, I can speak from a base standpoint, you know, we're, we're, we're heads down focusing on the, the projects that are out there um, to be executed. And as Justin talked about, there's, there's great opportunity, both economically and from an, an emissions reduction, reduction standpoint 
um, for the globe. So, you know, the specifically relative to China and their energy policies, as Sean talked about, there there is the ETS there. Um, but you know, it's I think that it's it's a it's a holistic solution. And you know, you're you know, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And I think that what what we're doing and the people on this panel are, are are advancing it as much as we can, one bite at a time. And just there's some. No, oh, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead no. I, 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 there was one point that I wanted uh, maybe briefly to to come back to and, and, and react to. You know, what are the opportunities for uh, for investors? I, I think uh, if you look at an investor, uh, Michael said it very well. You have to be you know conscious about risk, and and I think. Uh, when you look at a vehicle like uh, like an ETF that John has, when you look at the companies like Michael and Justin, you know, solid companies backed by by very solid teams, like these are the vehicles to to look at. And I think that that is where your opportunities are. It's transparent uh, markets. It's it's easy to follow. That is what you should focus on. I would say be careful about uh, a couple of things. You can buy carbons directly, carbon credits directly. There is all kinds of online markets available. Cautious <laughs> if you're not if you're not an expert and if you don't understand how some of those market works, uh, those markets work. I would not touch it. Um, and doesn't feel very comfortable to me, to be very honest. Two futures markets. That's a very complex market, also. So go through, uh, you know, expertise, people who understand, people who know. Don't go directly into futures markets. Those are really markets for uh, for for professionals. And then the last comment, uh, and uh, you know, this is uh, me looking in the crystal ball, but I guarantee you that we're going to see lots of additional companies emerging in this sector. And uh, there's going to be great ones. There's going to be top quality ones, you know, like like the bases and and and, and like the carbon streamings. And then we're going to see a lot of companies that uh, you probably don't want to touch. And, and I would also say to investors, be very careful about that. I've seen it every time when uh, a sector is, 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 is becoming, you know, a, a sector of, of, of true growth. Look back uh, at, uh, you know, it's still happening. Look back at the digital asset sector. Look back at the psychedelics, uh, biotech sector. Uh, you know, go back to, to cannabis. You've got some great companies coming out. And then suddenly you have a flurry. Of, of companies you have to be very cautious uh, for. I can tell you that from our perspective, we're gonna do our best uh, to uh, to keep those away from our market because typically they are characterized by a few things. Okay, and we have so many great questions coming in, but um, we're almost close to running out of time. But let me ask this as well. One of the questions is about institutional investors coming into this market. Um, what, can the, what can NEO do to increase that pace? And what will be the market marker to tell us that institutions are, are really um, moving in and making investments, whether it's direct or into the public markets? I, I, I think what, what, what we bring, and, and, and I think that that's important from, from an institutional investor perspective, we, we bring uh, listings on uh, you know, what I define as, as being a senior exchange. And, and what that means is that uh, companies that list with us are not venture companies. And, and the big difference between venture companies and, and senior companies is, is related to uh, governance criteria. It's related to financial controls, financial reporting. It's also related to you know, a certain set of, of requirements that you need to comply with you know, from, from an exchange perspective. That is important for institutional investors because they typically do not invest in, in venture companies. So we're giving them, uh, you know, by enabling uh, companies like, uh, like Base Carbon and, and Carbon Streaming to come uh, on NEO, we're, we're enabling them to, to, to go and talk to institutional investors. The second thing that I believe is very important, it will also attract uh, institutional investors, that is, uh, to become part of a benchmark, and we have seen that now, uh, you know, some of the neo-listed companies are, are part of, of, of benchmarks like MSCI, FTSE, and, and, and more to come. Uh, that is a vehicle that is typically used by large institutional investors also. And, uh, you know, we've seen it with a number of the companies listed with us, how, you know, those investors emerge in, 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 in those companies because they are part of those benchmarks. Again, that is only possible if you are an, a non-venture company, if you are a senior company, as I explained it uh, earlier. So I think that 
what, what we do is we bring the, the, the credibility of a senior exchange, we bring the mechanisms and, 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 and the possibilities of a senior exchange uh, to uh, these organizations that, that come to us. And, and that is going to be critical to the institutional investor. And then besides that, uh, you know, we'll continue uh, and, 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 and make sure that we, we work on informing, educating. But to be honest with you, I don't think that the institutional community needs so much. I think that there are, you know, more and more of them are, are, are getting it and you see them stepping into, into the market, into quality companies. Uh, but, uh, you know, awareness is probably important also, making sure that there's a lot of awareness about, you know, these, these opportunities that are now present on, uh, on our exchange. Okay. And, and then maybe a last thought that I will leave with you. I think that what we are doing today uh, here in, in, in Canada uh, and, and, you know, the, being at the forefront of, of, of this industry, like, like we did with a few other ones, I, I expect, uh, and, and you should expect, uh, all of you should expect to see that being amplified within the frame of uh, what we are doing uh, with uh, with Cibo Global Markets, uh, which, as you know, is a, is a global organization. So I think that mm. uh, we will not only be able to do what we do here, uh, you know, from from a leadership perspective in, in a domestic way or in a regional way, but I think we're going to be able to come with some global solutions, which which are going to be great for everyone. And a wonderful point to end on. Uh, I want to thank everyone for the conversation uh, today. It's been incredibly insightful and amazing questions that we did not get to get all of them too, but uh, but I, I hope we do more of these educational um, in, informational panels. It was really great. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to send it back to Eric. Eric, thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, absolutely fascinating uh, discussion. You know, having listened now for the last 45 minutes or so, uh, the group talking about this perhaps new to us uh, industry, uh, the one that clearly has corporate and, and political support and is rapidly evolving as a sector of, of capital markets aimed at providing companies opportunities to meet their compliance requirements. Uh, the industry as a whole continues to make headlines and, and at a rapid pace, and as a result, uh, deliver an opportunity for you, our investors. Um, for our investors, this, this was a bit of a masterclass uh, in, in carbon markets. Uh, you heard John Wilson at Nine Point providing an overview of the industry, volunteering compliance markets, from Justin at Carbon Streaming, clear driven focus to develop and build up credits in the voluntary market and the role companies can and perhaps have to play to accelerate this sector. From Michael at uh, Base Carbon, criticality of public capital to bring investment dollars to bear with expertise, experience and opportunity. Uh, you heard from Honorable John Baird, uh, the role and impact that global macro events and company specific activist initiatives can have on corporate objectives, inclusive of the tie to a broader global political agenda. And, and lastly, from our CEO, Joss at Neo, uh, our role is a tier one Canadian exchange, gluing together all components of these markets, both in Canada and abroad, supporting companies and funds attached to the innovation economy and driven ultimately by our interest and drive for transparent, education-oriented capital markets suitable for all manner of investors. So a tremendous thank you, uh, obviously, first to our, our sponsors who helped bring all of you to us today for this educational, insightful, and, and valuable discussion on the pathway to net zero via carbon credits. A uh, quick recap on, on the names. I'll go in reverse order uh, to ensure we're, we're fair to our, our sponsors, World of Ordelis, Steichmans, Odyssey, Miller-Thompson, McMillan, Gowlings, Goodmans, Dentons, Castles, BLG, Bennett Jones, Baker McKenzie, and Air Burles. To our guests today, John Wilson, Justin, Michael, Joss, thank you for sharing your time, thoughts, and insights with our audience. Catherine, uh, where would we be without a truly uh, experienced navigator on, on this discussion today and teasing out the opportunity in this accelerating asset class for our viewers? Thank you. And special thanks to the Honorable John Baird for setting the tone of this Neo Presents today with a keynote speech steeped in incredible experience in both business and politics and the role both have to play to deliver. To our audience, thanks for joining us, for your active participation in shaping the dialogue today and for listening in over the lunch to this incredible group. We hope to see you again soon uh, for another NEO Presents. And if you are unable to join for the entire event, we'll have a recording uh, to follow shortly. Uh, everyone, we are officially both out and over time by a few moments. We appreciate you hanging around for a, a few moments to catch the recap. On behalf of the NEO Exchange team, our presenters today, 
I would like to thank all of you for joining us, and we hope you have a safe and healthy afternoon heading into the March break here in Canada. This is the New Exchange signing off. Thank you all very much. Mm-hmm.